Chapter One of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Celine Major. The Mysteries of Paris, Volume Four by Eugène Sue. Chapter One, Part One. Rigolette's First Sorrow. Rigolette's apartment was still in all its extreme nicety the large silver watch placed over the mantelpiece in a small boxwood stand denoted the hour of four the severe cold weather having ceased the thrifty little needlewoman had not lighted her stove from the window a corner of blue sky was scarcely perceptible over the masses of irregularly built roofs garrets and tall chimneys which bounded the horizon on the other side of the street suddenly a sunbeam which as it were wandered for a moment between two high gables came for an instant to purple with its bright rays the windows of the young girl's chamber rigolette was at work seated by her window and the soft shadow of her charming profile stood out from the transparent light of the glass as a cameo of rosy whiteness on a silver ground brilliant hues played on her jet-black hair twisted in a knot at the back of her head and shaded with a warm amber colour the ivory of her industrious little fingers which plied the needle with incomparable activity the long folds of her brown gown confined at the waist by the bands of her green apron half concealed her straw-seated chair and her pretty feet rested on the edge of a stool before her like a rich lord who sometimes amuses himself in hiding the walls of a cottage beneath splendid hangings the setting sun for a moment lighted up this little chamber with a thousand dazzling fires throwing his golden tints on the curtains of grey and green stuff and making the walnut-tree furniture glisten with brightness and the dry rubbed floor looked like heated copper whilst it encircled in a wire-work of gold the grisette's bird-cage but alas in spite of the exciting splendour of this sun-ray the two canaries male and female flitted about uneasily and contrary to their usual habit did not sing a note this was because contrary to her usual habit rigolette did not sing the three never warbled without one another almost invariably the cheerful and matin song of the latter called forth that of the birds who more lazy did not leave their nests as early as their mistress then there were rivalries contentions of clear sonorous pearly silvery notes in which the birds had not always the advantage rigolette did not sing because for the first time in her life she experienced a sorrow up to this time the sight of the misery of the morels had often affected her but such sights are too familiar to the poorer classes to cause them any very lasting melancholy after having almost every day succored these unfortunates as far as was in her power sincerely wept with and for them the young girl felt herself at the same time moved and satisfied moved by their misfortunes and satisfied at having shown herself pitiful but this was not a sorrow rigolette's natural gaiety soon regained its empire and then without egotism but by a simple fact of comparison she found herself so happy in her little chamber after leaving the horrible den of the morels that her momentary sadness speedily disappeared this lightness of impression was so little affected by personal feeling that by a mode of extremely delicate reasoning the grisette considered it almost a duty to aid those more unhappy than herself that she might thus unscrupulously enjoy an existence so very precarious and entirely dependent on her labour but which compared with the fearful distress of the lapidary's family appeared to her almost luxurious in order to sing without compunction when we have near us persons so much to be pitied she said naively we must have been as charitable to them as possible before we inform our reader the cause of rigolette's first sorrow we are desirous to assure him or her completely as to the virtue of this young girl we are sorry to use the word virtue a serious pompous solemn word which almost always brings with it ideas of painful sacrifice of painful struggle against the passions of austere meditations on the final close of all things here below such was not the virtue of rigolette she had neither deeply struggled nor meditated she had worked and laughed and sung her prudence as she called it when speaking frankly and sincerely to rodolph was with her a question of time she had not the leisure to be in love particularly lively industrious and orderly order work and gaiety had often unknown to herself defended sustained saved her it may be deemed perchance that this morality is light frivolous casual 
but of what consequence is the cause so that the effect endures of what consequence are the directions of the roots of a plant provided the flower blooms pure expanded and full of perfume apropos of our utopianisms as to the encouragement help and recompenses which society ought to grant to artisans remarkable for their eminent social qualities we have alluded to that protection of virtue one of the projects of the emperor by the way let us suppose this admirable idea realized one of the real philanthropists whom the emperor proposed to employ in searching after worth had discovered rigolette abandoned without advice without aid exposed to all the perils of poverty to all the seductions with which youth and beauty are surrounded this charming girl has remained pure her honest hard-working life might serve for a model and example would not this young creature deserve not a mere recompense not succour only but some impressive words of approbation and encouragement which would give her a consciousness of her own worth exalt her in her own eyes and lay on her obligations for the future at least she would know that she was followed by eyes full of solicitude and protection in the difficult path in which she is progressing with so much courage and serenity she would know that if one day the want of work or sickness threatened to destroy the equilibrium of the poor and occupied life which depends solely on work and health a slight help due to her former deserts would be given to her people no doubt will exclaim against the impossibility of this tutelary surveillance which would surround persons particularly worthy of interest through their previous excellent lives it seems to us that society has already resolved this problem has it not already imagined the superintendence of the police for a life or for a period for the most useful purpose of constantly controlling the conduct of dangerous persons noted for the infamy of their former lives why does not society exercise also a superintendence of moral charity but let us leave the lofty stilts of our utopianisms and return to the cause of rigolette's first sorrow with the exception of germain a well-behaved open-hearted young man the grisette's neighbours had all at first begun on terms of familiarity believing her offers of good neighbourship were little flirtations but these gentlemen had been compelled to admit with as much astonishment as annoyance that they found in rigolette an amiable and mirthful companion for their sunday excursions a pleasant neighbour and a kind-hearted creature but not a mistress their surprise and their annoyance at first very great gradually gave way before the frank and even temper of the grisette and then as she had sagaciously said to rodolph her neighbours were proud on sundays to have on their arms a pretty girl who was an honour to them in every way rigolette was quite regardless of appearances and who only cost them the share of the moderate pleasures whose value was doubled by her presence and nice appearance besides the dear girl was so easily contented in her days of penury she dined well and gaily off a morsel of warm cake which she nibbled with all the might of her little white teeth after which she amused herself so much with a walk on the boulevard or in the arcades if our readers feel but little sympathy with rigolette they will at least confess that a person must be very absurd or very cruel to refuse once a week these simple amusements to so delightful a creature who besides having no right to be jealous never prevented her cavaliers from consoling themselves for her cruelty by flirtations with other damsels François germain alone never founded any vain hopes on the familiarity of the young girl but either from instinct of heart or delicacy of mind he guessed from the first day how very agreeable the singular companionship of rigolette might be made what might be imagined happened and germain fell passionately in love with his neighbour without daring to say a word to her of his love far from imitating his predecessors who convinced of the vanity of their pursuit had consoled themselves with other loves without being on that account the less on good terms with their neighbour germain had most supremely enjoyed his intimacy with the young girl passing with her not only his sunday but every evening when he was not engaged during these long hours rigolette was as usual merry and laughing germain tender attentive serious and often somewhat sad this sadness was his only drawback for his manners naturally good were not to be compared with the foppery of m girandeau the commercial traveller alias bagman or with the noisy eccentricities of cabrion but m girandeau by his unending loquacity and the painter by his equally interminable fun took the lead of germain whose quiet composure rather astonished his little neighbour the grisette 
rigolette then had not as yet testified any decided preference for any one of her beaux but as she was by no means deficient in judgment she soon discovered that germain alone united all the qualities requisite for making a reasonable woman happy having stated all these facts we will inquire why rigolette was sad and why neither she nor her bird sang her oval and fresh-looking face was rather pale her large black eyes usually gay and brilliant were slightly dulled and veiled whilst her whole look bespoke unusual fatigue she had been working nearly all the night from time to time she looked sorrowfully at a letter which lay open on a table near her this letter had been addressed to her by germain and contained as follows prison of the conciergerie mademoiselle the place from which i address you will sufficiently prove to you the extent of my misfortune i am locked up as a robber i am guilty in the eyes of all the world and yet i am bold enough to write to you it is because it would indeed be dreadful to me to believe that you consider me as a degraded criminal i beseech you not to condemn me until you have perused this letter if you discard me that will be the final blow and it will indeed overwhelm me i will tell you all that has passed for some time i had left the rue du temple but i knew through poor louise that the morel family in whom you and i took such deep interest were daily more and more wretched alas my pity for these poor people has been my destruction i do not repent it but my fate is very cruel last night i had stayed very late at m ferrand's occupied with business of importance in the room in which i was at work was a bureau in which my employer shut up every day the work i had done this evening he appeared much disturbed and troubled and said to me do not leave until these accounts are finished and then put them in the bureau the key of which i will leave with you and then he left the room when my work was done i opened the door to put it away when mechanically my eyes were attracted by an open letter on which i read the name of jerome morel the lapidary i confess that seeing that it referred to this unfortunate man i had the indiscretion to read this letter and i learnt that the artisan was to be arrested next day on an overdue bill of thirteen hundred francs at the suit of m ferrand who under an assumed name had imprisoned him this information was from an agent employed by m ferrand i knew enough of the situation of the morel family to be aware of the terrible blow which the imprisonment of their only support must inflict upon them and i was equally distressed and indignant unfortunately i saw in the same drawer an open box with two thousand francs in gold in it at this moment i heard louise coming up the stairs and without reflecting on the seriousness of my offence but profiting by the opportunity which chance offered i took thirteen hundred francs went to her in the passage and put the money in her hand saying they are going to arrest your father to-morrow at daybreak for thirteen hundred francs here they are save him but do not say that the money comes from me m ferrand is a bad man you see mademoiselle my intention was good but my conduct culpable i conceal nothing from you but this is my excuse by dint of saving for a long time i had realized and placed with a banker the sum of fifteen hundred francs but the cashier of the banker never came to the office before noon morel was to be arrested at daybreak and therefore it was necessary that she should have the money so as to pay it in good time if not even i could have gone in the day to release him from prison still he would be arrested and carried off in presence of his wife whom such a blow must have killed besides the heavy costs of the writ would have been added to the expenses of the lapidary you will understand i dare say that all these new misfortunes would not have befallen me if i had been able to restore the thirteen hundred francs i had taken back again to the bureau before m ferrand discovered anything unfortunately i fell into that mistake i left m ferrand's and was no longer under the impression of indignation and pity which had impelled me to the step i began to reflect upon all the dangers of my position a thousand fears then came to assail me i knew the notary's severity and he might come after i left and search in his bureau and discover the theft for in his eyes in the eyes of the world it is a theft these thoughts overwhelmed me and late as it was i ran to the bankers to supplicate him to give me my money instantly i should have found an excuse for this urgent request and then i should have returned to m ferrand and replaced the money i had taken by unlucky chance the banker had gone to belleville for two days to his country house where he was engaged in some plantations everything seemed to conspire against me 
i waited for daybreak with intense anxiety and hastened to belleville the banker had just left for paris i returned saw him obtained my money hastened to m ferrand everything was discovered but this is only a portion of my misfortunes the notary at once accused me of having robbed him of fifteen thousand francs in banknotes which he declared were in the drawer of the bureau with the two thousand francs in gold this was a base accusation an infamous lie i confess myself guilty of the first abstraction but by all that is most sacred in the world i swear to you mademoiselle that i am innocent of the second i never saw a banknote in the drawer there were only two thousand francs in gold from which i took the thirteen hundred francs i have mentioned this is the truth mademoiselle i am under this terrible accusation and yet i affirm that you ought to know me incapable of a lie but will you do you believe me alas as m ferrand said he who has taken a small sum may equally have taken a large amount and his word does not deserve belief i have always seen you so good and devoted to the unhappy mademoiselle and i know you are so frank and liberal-minded that your heart will guide you in the just appreciation of the truth i hope i do not ask any more give credit to my words and you will find in me as much to pity as to blame for i repeat to you my intention was good and circumstances impossible to foresee have destroyed me oh mademoiselle rigolette i am very unhappy if you knew in the midst of what a set of persons i am doomed to exist until my trial is over yesterday they took me to a place which they call the depot of the prefecture of police i cannot tell you what i felt when after having gone up a dark staircase i reached a door with an iron wicket which was opened and soon closed upon me i was so troubled in my mind that i could not at first distinguish anything a hot and fetid air came upon me and i heard a loud noise of voices mingled with sinister laughs angry exclamations and depraved songs i remained motionless at the door for a while looking at the stone flooring of the apartment and neither daring to advance nor lift up my eyes thinking that everybody was looking at me they were not however thinking of me for a prisoner more or less does not at all disturb these men at last i ventured to look up and oh what horrid countenances what ragged wretches what dirty and bespattered garments all the exterior marks of misery and vice there were forty or fifty seated standing or lying on benches secured to the wall vagrants robbers assassins and all who had been apprehended during the night and day when they perceived me i found a sad consolation in seeing that they did not recognize me as belonging or known to them some of them looked at me with an insulting and derisive air and then began to talk amongst themselves in a low tone and in some horrible jargon not one word of which did i understand after a short time one of the most brutal amongst them came and slapping me on the shoulder asked me for some money to pay my footing i gave them some silver hoping thus to purchase repose but it was not enough and they demanded more which i refused then several of them surrounded me and assailed me with threats and imprecations and were proceeding to extremities when fortunately for me a turnkey entered who had been attracted by the noise i complained to him and he insisted on their restoring to me the money i had given them already adding that if i liked to pay a small fee i should go to what is called the pistole that is be in a cell by myself i accepted the offer gratefully and left these ruffians in the midst of their loud menaces for the future for said they we are sure to meet again when i could not get away from them the turnkey conducted me to a cell where i passed the rest of the night it is from here that i now write to you mademoiselle rigolette directly after my examination i shall be taken to another prison called la force where i expect to meet many of my companions in the station-house the turnkey interested by my grief and tears has promised me to forward this letter to you although such kindnesses are strictly forbidden i ask mademoiselle rigolette the last service of your friendship if indeed you do not blush now for such an intimacy in case you will kindly grant my request it is this with this letter you will receive a small key and a line for the porter of the house i live in boulevard st denis number eleven i inform him that you will act as if it were myself with respect to everything that belongs to me and that he is to attend to your instructions 
he will take you to my room and you will have the goodness to open my secretaire with the key i send you herewith in this you will find a large packet containing different papers which i beg of you to take care of for me one of them was intended for you as you will see by the address others have been written of you in happier days do not be angry i did not think they would ever come to your knowledge i beg you also to take the small sum of money which is in this drawer as well as a satin bag which contains a small orange silk handkerchief which you wore when we used to go out on sundays and which you gave me on the day i quitted the rue du temple i should wish that excepting a little linen which you will be so good as to send to me at la force you will sell the furniture and things i possess for whether acquitted or found guilty i must of necessity be obliged to quit paris where shall i go what are my resources god only knows madame bouvard the saleswoman of the temple who has already sold and bought for me many things will perhaps take all the furniture etc at once she is a very fair dealing woman and this would save you a great deal of trouble for i know how precious your time is i have paid my rent in advance and i have therefore only to ask you to give a small present to the porter excuse mademoiselle the trouble of these details but you are the only person in the world to whom i dare and can address myself i might perhaps have asked one of m ferrand's clerks to do this service for me as we were on friendly terms but i feared his curiosity as to certain papers several concern you as i have said and others relate to the sad events in my life ah believe me mademoiselle rigolette if you grant me this last favour this last proof of former regard it will be my only consolation under the great affliction in which i am plunged and in spite of all i hope you will not refuse me i also beg of you to give me permission to write to you sometimes it will be so consoling so comforting to me to be able to pour out my heavy sorrows into a kind heart alas i am alone in the world no one takes the slightest interest in me this isolation was before most painful to me think what it must be now and yet i am honest and have the consciousness of never having injured any one and of always having at the peril of my life testified my aversion for what is wicked and wrong as you will see by the papers which i pray of you to take care of and which you may read but when i say this who will believe me m ferrand is respected by all the world his reputation for probity is long established he has a just cause of accusation against me and he will crush me i resign myself at once to my fate now mademoiselle rigolette if you do believe me you will not i hope feel any contempt for me but pity me and you will perhaps carry your generosity so far as to come one day some sunday alas what recollections that word brings up some sunday to see me in the reception-room of my prison but no no i never could dare to see you in such a place yet you are so good so kind that if i am compelled to break off this letter and send it to you at once with the key and a line for the porter which i write in great haste the turnkey has come to tell me that i am going directly before the magistrate adieu adieu mademoiselle rigolette do not discard me for my hope is in you and in you only françois germain p s if you reply address your letter to me at the prison of la force end of chapter 1 part 1 read by celine major chapter 1 part 2 of the mysteries of paris volume 4 by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain rigolette's first sorrow part 2 we may now divine the cause of rigolette's first sorrow her excellent heart was deeply wounded at a misfortune of which she had no suspicion until that moment she believed unhesitatingly in the entire veracity of the statement of germain the unfortunate son of the schoolmaster not very straight-laced she thought her old neighbour exaggerated his fault immensely to save the unhappy father of a family he had momentarily appropriated a sum which he thought he could instantly refund this action in the grisette's eyes was but generous by one of those contradictions common to women and especially to women of her class this young girl who until then had not felt for germain more than her other neighbours but a kind and mirthful friendship now experienced for him a decided preference 
as soon as she knew that he was unfortunate unjustly accused and a prisoner his remembrance effaced that of all his former rivals yet rigolette did not all at once feel intense love but a warm and sincere affection full of pity and determined devotion a sentiment which was the more new with her in consequence of the better sensations it brought with it such was the moral position of rigolette when rodolph entered her chamber having first rapped very discreetly at the door good morning neighbour said rodolph to rigolette do not let me disturb you not at all neighbour on the contrary i am delighted to see you for i have had something to vex me dreadfully why in truth you look very pale and appear as though you had been weeping indeed i have been weeping and for a good reason poor germain there read and rigolette handed the letter of the prisoner to rodolph is not that enough to break one's heart you told me you took an interest in him now's the time to prove it she added whilst rodolph was attentively reading the letter is that wicked old monsieur ferrand at war with all the world first he attacked that poor louise and now he assailed germain oh i am not ill-natured but if some great harm happened to this notary i should really be glad to accuse such an honest young man of having stolen fifteen thousand francs from him germain too he who was honesty itself and such a steady serious young man and so sad too oh he is indeed to be pitied in the midst of all these wretches in this prison ah monsieur rodolphe from to-day i begin to see that life is not all couleur de rose and what do you propose to do my little neighbour what do i mean to do why of course all that germain asks of me and as quickly as possible i should have been gone before now but for this work which is required in great haste and which i must take instantly to the rue st honore on my way to germain's room where i am going to get the papers he speaks of i have passed part of the night at work that i might be forward i shall have so many things to do besides my usual work that i must be excessively methodical in the first place madame morel is very anxious that i should see louise in prison that will be a hard task but i shall try to do it unfortunately i do not know to whom i should address myself i had thought of that you neighbour here is an order how fortunate can't you procure me also an order for the prison of poor unhappy germain he would be so delighted i will also find you the means of seeing germain oh thank you monsieur rodolphe you will not be afraid then of going to his prison certainly not although my heart will beat very violently the first time but that's nothing when germain was free was he not always ready to anticipate all my wishes and take me to the theatre for a walk or read to me of an evening well and now he is in trouble it is my turn a poor little mouse like me cannot do much i know that well enough but all i can do i will do that he may rely upon he shall find that i am a sincere friend but monsieur rodolphe there is one thing which pains me and that is that he should doubt me that he should suppose me capable of despising him i and for what i should like to know that old notary accuses him of robbery i know it is not true germain's letter has proved to me that he is innocent even if i had thought him guilty you have only to see him and you would feel certain that he is incapable of a bad action a person must be as wicked as m ferrand to assert such atrocious falsehoods bravo neighbour i like your indignation oh how i wish i were a man that i might go to this notary and say to him oh you say that germain has robbed you do you well then that's for you and that he cannot steal from you at all events and thump 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 i would beat him till i couldn't stand over him you administer justice very expeditiously said rodolph smiling because it makes my blood boil and as germain says in his letter all the world will side with his employer because he is rich and looked up to whilst germain is poor and unprotected unless you will come to his assistance monsieur rodolphe you who know such benevolent persons do not you think that something could be done he must await his sentence once acquitted as i believe he will be he will not want for proofs of the interest taken in him but listen neighbour for i know i may rely on your discretion oh yes monsieur rodolphe i never blab well then no one must know not even germain himself that he has friends who are watching over him for he has friends really very powerful and devoted it would give him much courage to know that 
unquestionably but perhaps he might not keep it to himself then m ferrand alarmed would be on his guard his suspicions would be aroused and as he is very cunning it would become very difficult to catch him which would be most annoying for not only must germain's innocence be made clear but his denouncer must be unmasked i understand m rodolph it is the same with louise and i bring you this order to see her that you may beg of her not to tell any person what she disclosed to me she will know what that means i understand m rodolph in a word let louise beware of complaining in prison of her master's wickedness this is most important but she must conceal nothing from the barrister who will come from me to talk with her as to the grounds of her defence be sure you tell her all this make yourself easy neighbour i will forget nothing i have an excellent memory but when we talk of goodness it is you who are so good and kind if any one is in trouble then you come directly i have told you my good little neighbour that i am but a poor clerk but when i meet with good persons who deserve protection i instantly tell a benevolent individual who has entire confidence in me and they are helped at once that's all i do in the matter and where are you lodging now you have given up your chamber to the morels i live in a furnished lodging oh how i should hate that to be where all the world has been before you it is as if everybody had been in your place i am only there at nights and then i understand it is less disagreeable yet i shouldn't like it monsieur rodolphe my home made me so happy i had got into such a quiet way of living that i did not think it was possible i should ever know a sorrow and yet you see but no i cannot describe to you the blow which germain's misfortune has brought upon me i have seen the morels and others beside who were very much to be pitied certainly but at best misery is misery and amongst poor folk who look for it it does not surprise them and they help one another as well as they can to-day it is one to-morrow it is another as for oneself what with courage and good spirit one extricates oneself but to see a poor young man honest and good who has been your friend for a long time to see him accused of robbery and imprisoned and huddled up with criminals ah oh, really monsieur rodolphe i cannot get over that it is a misfortune i had never thought of and it quite upsets me courage courage your spirits will return when your friend is acquitted oh yes he must be acquitted the judges have only to read his letter to me and that would be enough would it not monsieur rodolphe really this letter has all the appearance of truth you must let me have a copy of it for it will be necessary for germain's defence certainly monsieur rodolphe if i did not write such a scrawl in spite of the lessons which good germain gave me i would offer to copy it myself but my writing is so large so crooked and has so many many faults i will only ask you to trust the letter with me until to-morrow morning there it is but you will take great care of it i hope i have burnt all the notes which m cabrion and m girandeau wrote me in the beginning of our acquaintance with flaming hearts and doves at the top of the paper when they thought i was to be caught by their tricks and cajoleries but this poor letter of germain's i will keep carefully as well as the others if he writes me any more for they you know m rodolphe will show in my favour that he has asked these small services won't they m rodolphe most assuredly and they will prove that you are the best little friend any one can desire but now i think of it instead of going alone to germain's room shall i accompany you with pleasure neighbour the night is coming on and in the evening i do not like to be alone in the streets besides that i have my work to carry nearly as far as the palais royal but perhaps it will fatigue and annoy you to go so far not at all we will have a coach really oh how pleased i should be to go in a coach if i had not so much to make me melancholy and i really must be melancholy for this is the first day since i have been here that i have not sung during the day my birds are really quite astonished poor little dears they cannot make it out two or three times papa Crétu has piped a little to try me i endeavoured to answer him but after a minute or two i began to cry ramonette then began but i could not answer one any better than the other what singular names you have given your birds papa Crétu and ramonette why monsieur rodolphe my birds are the joy of my solitude my best friends 
and i have given them the names of the worthy couple who were the joy of my childhood and were also my best friends not forgetting that to complete the resemblance papa crétu and ramonette were gay and sang like birds ah now yes i remember your adopted parents were called so yes neighbour they are ridiculous names for birds i know but that concerns no one but myself and besides it was in this very point that germain showed his good heart in what way why m girandeau and m cabrion especially m cabrion were always making their jokes on the names of my birds to call a canary papa crétu there never was such nonsense as m cabrion made of it and his jests were endless if it was a cock-bird he said why that would be well enough to call him crétu as to ramonette that's well enough for a hen canary for it resembles ramona in fact he quite wore my patience out and for two sundays i would not go out with him in order to teach him a lesson and i told him very seriously that if he began his tricks which annoyed me so much we should never go out together again what a bold resolve yes it was really a sacrifice on my part m rodolph for i was always looking forward with delight to my sundays and i was very much tried by being kept in all alone in such beautiful weather but that's nothing i preferred sacrificing my sundays to hearing m cabrion continue to make ridicule of those whom i respected certainly after that but for the idea i attached to them i should have preferred giving my birds other names and you must know there is one name which i adore it is colibri note one i did not change because i never will call those birds by any other name than crétu and ramonette if i did i should seem to make a sacrifice that i forgot my good adopted parents don't you think so m rodolph note one colibri is a celebrated chanson of beranger the especial poet of grisettes english translator you are right a thousand times over and germain did not turn these names into a jest eh on the contrary the first time he heard them he thought them droll like every one else and that was natural enough but when i explained to him my reasons as i had many times explained them to m cabrion tears started to his eyes from that time i said to myself m germain is very kind-hearted and there is nothing to be said against him but his weeping so and so you see m rodolph my reproaching him with his sadness has made me unhappy now then i could not understand why any one was melancholy but now i understand it but too well but now my packet is completed and my work is ready for delivery will you hand me my shawl neighbour it is not cold enough to take a cloak is it we shall go and return in a coach true we shall go and return very quickly and that will be so much gained but now i think of it what are you to do your work will suffer from your visits to the prison oh no no i have made my calculations in the first place i have my sundays to myself so i shall go and see louise and germain on those days that will serve me for a walk and a change then in the week i shall go to the prison once or twice each time will occupy me three good hours won't it well to manage this comfortably i shall work an hour more every day and go to bed at twelve o'clock instead of eleven o'clock that will be a clear gain of seven or eight hours a week which i can employ in going to see louise and germain you see i am richer than i appear added rigolette with a smile and you have no fear that you will be over fatigued bah not at all i shall manage it and besides it can't last for ever here is your shawl neighbour fasten it and mind you don't prick me ah the pin is bent well then clumsy take another then from the pincushion ah i forgot will you do me a great favour neighbour command me neighbour mend me a good pen with a broad nib so that when i return i may write to poor germain and tell him i have executed all his commissions he will have my letter to-morrow morning in the prison and that will give him pleasure where are your pens there on the table the knife is in the drawer wait until i light my taper for it begins to grow dusk yes i shall see better how to mend the pen and i how to tie my cap rigolette lighted a lucifer match and lighted a wax end in a small bright candlestick the deuce a wax light why neighbour what extravagance 
or what i burn costs but a very small trifle more than a candle and it's so much cleaner not much dearer indeed they are not i buy these wax ends by the pound and half a pound lasts nearly a year but said rodolph who was mending the pen very carefully whilst the grisette was tying on her cap before the glass i do not see any preparations for your dinner i have not the least appetite i took a cup of milk this morning and i shall take another this evening with a small piece of bread and that will be enough for me then you will not take a dinner with me quietly after we have been to germain's thank you neighbour but i am not in spirits my heart is too heavy another time with pleasure but the evening when poor germain leaves his prison i invite myself and afterwards you shall take me to the theatre is that a bargain it is neighbour and i assure you i will not forget the engagement but you refuse me this to-day yes monsieur rodolph i should be a very dull companion without saying a word about the time it would occupy me for you see at this moment i really cannot afford to be idle or waste one single quarter of an hour then for to-day i renounce the pleasure there is my parcel neighbour now go out first and i will lock the door here's a capital pen for you and now for the parcel mind you don't rumple it it is poudre soie and soon creases hold it in your hand carefully there in that way that's it now go and i will show you a light and rodolph descended the staircase followed by rigolette at the moment when the two neighbours were passing by the door of the porter's lodge they saw m pipelet who with his arms hanging down was advancing towards them from the bottom of the passage holding in one hand the sign which announced his partnership of friendship with cabrion and in the other the portrait of the confounded painter alfred's despair was so overwhelming that his chin touched his breast so that the wide crown of his bell-shaped hat was easily seen seeing him thus with his head lowered coming towards rodolphe and rigolette he might have been compared to a ram or a brave breton preparing for combat anastasie soon appeared on the threshold of the lodge and exclaimed at her husband's appearance well dearest old boy here you are and what did the commissary say to you alfred alfred mind what you're doing or you'll poke your head against my king of lodgers excuse him monsieur rodolphe it is that vagabond of a cabrion who uses him worse and worse he'll certainly turn my dear old darling into a donkey alfred love speak to me at this voice so dear to his heart m pipelet raised his head his features were impressed with a bitter agony what did the commissary say to you inquired anastasie anastasie we must collect the few things we possess embrace our friends pack up our trunk and expatriate ourselves from paris from france from my beautiful france for now assured of impunity the monster is capable of pursuing me everywhere throughout the length and breadth of the departments of the kingdom what the commissary the commissary exclaimed m pipelet with fierce indignation the commissary laughed in my teeth at you a man of mature age with an air so respectable that you would appear as silly as a goose if one did not know your virtues well notwithstanding that when i had respectfully deposed in his presence my mass of complaints and vexations against that infernal cabrion the magistrate after having looked and laughed yes laughed and i may add laughed indecorously at the sign and the portrait which i brought with me as corroborative testimony the magistrate replied my good fellow this cabrion is a wag a practical joker but pay no attention to his pleasantries i advise you to laugh at him and heartily too for really there is ample cause to do so to laugh at it sir i exclaimed to laugh at it when grief consumes me when this scamp poisons my very existence he placards me and will drive me out of my wits i demand that they imprison exile the monster at least from my street at these words the commissary smiled and politely pointed to the door i understood the magistrate sighed and and here i am 
good for nothing magistrate exclaimed madame pipelet it is all over anastasie all is ended hope ceases there's no justice in france i am really atrociously sacrificed and by way of peroration m pipelet dashed the sign and portrait to the farther end of the passage with all his force rodolphe and rigolette had in the shade smiled at m pipelet's despair after having said a few words of consolation to alfred whom anastasie was trying to calm as well as she could the king of lodgers left the house in the rue du temple with rigolette and they both got into a coach to go to françois germain's End of chapter one read by celine major chapter two of the mysteries of paris volume four by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain the will françois germain resided number eleven boulevard st denis it may not be amiss to recall to the reader who has probably forgotten the circumstance that madame mathieu the diamond matcher whose name has been already mentioned as the person for whom morel the lapidary worked lodged in the same house as germain during the long ride from the rue du temple to the rue st honore where dwelt the dressmaker for whom rigolette worked rodolph had ample opportunities of more fully appreciating the fine natural disposition of his companion like all instinctively noble and devoted characters she appeared utterly unconscious of the delicacy and generosity of her conduct all she said and did seeming to her as the most simple and matter-of-course thing possible nothing would have been more easy than for rodolph to provide liberally both for rigolette's present and future wants and thus to have enabled her to carry her consoling attentions to louise and germain without grieving over the loss of that time which was necessarily taken from her work her sole dependence but the prince was unwilling to diminish the value of the grisette's devotion by removing all the difficulties and although firmly resolved to bestow a rich reward on the rare and beautiful qualities he hourly discovered in her he determined to follow her to the termination of this new and interesting trial it is scarcely necessary to say that had the health of the young girl appeared to suffer in the smallest degree from the increase of labour she so courageously imposed on herself in order to dedicate a portion of each week to the unhappy daughter of the lapidary and the son of the schoolmaster rodolph would instantaneously have stepped forward to her aid and he continued to study with equal pleasure and emotion the workings of a nature so naturally disposed to view everything on its sunny side so full of internal happiness and so little accustomed to sorrow that occasionally she would smile and seem the mirthful creature nature had made her spite of all the grief by which she was surrounded at the end of about an hour the fiacre returning from the rue st honore stopped before a modest unpretending sort of house situated at number eleven boulevard st denis rodolph assisted rigolette to alight the young sempstress then proceeded to the porter's lodge where she communicated germain's intentions without forgetting the promised gratuity owing to the extreme amenity of his disposition the son of the schoolmaster was unusually beloved and the confrere of m pipelet was deeply grieved to learn that so quiet and well conducted a lodger was about to quit the house and to that purpose the worthy porter warmly expressed himself having obtained a light rigolette proceeded to rejoin her companion having first arranged with the porter that he should not follow her upstairs till the time she indicated should have elapsed and then merely to receive his final orders the chamber occupied by germain was situated on the fourth floor when they reached the door rigolette handed the key to rodolph saying here will you open the door my hand trembles so violently i cannot do it i fear you will laugh at me but when i think that poor germain will never more enter this room i seem as though i were about to pass the threshold of a chamber of death come come my good neighbour try and exert yourself you must not indulge such thoughts as these i know it is wrong but indeed i cannot help it and here rigolette tried to dry up the tears with which her eyes were filled without being equally affected as his companion rodolph still experienced a deep and painful emotion as he penetrated into this humble abode well aware of the detestable pertinacity with which the accomplices of the schoolmaster pursued and were possibly still pursuing germain he pictured to himself the many hours the unfortunate youth was constrained to pass in this cheerless solitude rigolette placed the light on the table nothing could possibly be more simple than the fittings up of the apartment itself 
its sole furniture consisted of a small bed a chest of drawers a walnut tree bureau four rush-bottomed chairs and a table white calico curtains hung from the windows and around the bed the only ornament the mantelpiece presented was a water bottle and glass the bed was made but by the impression left on it it would seem that germain had thrown himself on it without undressing on the night previous to his arrest poor fellow said rigolette sadly as she examined each minute detail of the interior of the apartment it is very easy to see i was not near him his room is tidy to be sure but not as neat as it ought to be everything is covered with dust the curtains are smoke dried the windows want cleaning and the floor is not kept as it should be oh dear what a difference the rue du temple was not a better room but it had a much more cheerful look because everything was kept so bright and clean like in my apartment because in the rue du temple he had the benefit of your advice and assistance oh pray look here cried rigolette pointing to the bed only see the poor fellow never went to bed at all the last night he was here how uneasy he must have been see he has left his handkerchief on his pillow quite wet with his tears i can see that plainly enough then taking up the handkerchief she added germain has kept a small orange-coloured silk cravat i gave him once during our happy days i have a great mind to keep this handkerchief in remembrance of his misfortune do you think he would be angry on the contrary he would but be too much delighted with such a mark of your affection ah but we must not indulge in such thoughts now let us attend to more serious matters i will make up a parcel of linen from the contents of those drawers ready to take to the prison and mother bouvard whom i will send to-morrow will see to the rest but first of all i will open the bureau in order to get out the papers and money germain wished me to take charge of but now i think of it louise morel gave me back yesterday the thirteen hundred francs in gold she received from germain to pay the lapidary's debt which i had already discharged i have this money about me it justly belongs to germain since he repaid the notary what he withdrew from the cash-box i will place it in your hands in order that you may add to it the sum entrusted to your care just as you like monsieur rodolph although really i should prefer not having so large a sum in my possession really there are so many dishonest people nowadays as for papers that's quite another thing i'll willingly take charge of as many papers as you please but money is such a dangerous thing perhaps you are right then i tell you what we will do eh neighbour i will be banker and undertake the responsibility of guarding this money should germain require anything you can let me know i will leave you my address and whatever you send for shall be punctually and faithfully sent oh dear yes that will be very much better how good of you to offer for i could not have ventured to propose such a thing to you so that is settled i will beg of you also to take whatever this furniture sells for and now let us see about the papers continued rigolette opening the bureau and pulling out several drawers ah i dare say this is it see what a large packet but oh good gracious monsieur rodolph do pray look what mournful words these are written on the outside and here rigolette in a faltering voice read as follows in the event of my dying by either a violent or natural death i request whoever may open this bureau to carry these peepers to mademoiselle rigolette the dressmaker number seventeen rue du temple do you think monsieur rodolph that i may break the seals of the envelope undoubtedly does not germain expressly say that among the papers you will find a letter particularly addressed to yourself the agitated girl broke the seals which secured the outward cover and from it fell a quantity of papers one of which bearing the superscription of mademoiselle rigolette contained these words mademoiselle when this letter reaches your hands i shall be no more if as i fear i should perish by a violent death through falling into a snare similar to that from which i lately escaped a few particulars herein enclosed and entitled notes of my life may serve to discover my murderers ah monsieur rodolph cried rigolette interrupting herself i am no longer astonished poor germain was so melancholy how very dreadful to be continually pursued by such ideas he must indeed have suffered deeply but trust me his worst misfortunes are over alas monsieur rodolph i trust it may prove so still to be in prison and accused of theft make yourself quite easy about him his innocence once proved instead of returning to his former seclusion and loneliness 
he will regain his friends you first and foremost and then a dearly loved mother from whom he has been separated from his childhood his mother has he then still a mother he has but she has long believed him lost to her for ever imagine her delight at seeing him again cleared from the unworthy charge now brought against him you see i was right in saying that his greatest troubles were over do not mention his mother to him i entrust you with this secret because you take so generous an interest in the fate of germain that it is but due to your devotedness that you should be tranquillized as to his future fate oh thank you monsieur rodolphe i promise you to guard the secret as carefully as you could do rigolette then proceeded with the perusal of germain's letter it continued thus should you deign mademoiselle to cast your eyes over these notes you will find that i have been unfortunate all my life always unhappy except during the hours i have passed with you you will find sentiments i should never have ventured to express by words fully revealed in a sort of memorandum entitled my only days of happiness nearly every evening after quitting you i thus poured forth the cheering thoughts with which your affection inspired me and which only sweetened the bitterness of a cup full even to overflowing that which was but friendship in you was in my breast the purest the sincerest love but of that love i have never spoken no i reserved its full disclosure till the moment should arrive when i could be but as an object of your sorrowing recollection no never would i have sought to involve you in a destiny as thoroughly miserable as my own but when your eye peruses these pages there will be nothing to fear from the power of my ill-starred fate i shall have been your faithful friend your adoring lover but i shall no longer be dangerous to your future happiness in either sense i have but one last wish and desire and i trust that you will kindly accomplish it i have witnessed the noble courage with which you labour day by day as well as the care and management requisite to make your hard-earned gains suffice for your moderate wants often i have shuddered at the bare idea of your being reduced by illness brought on probably by over-attention to your work to a state too frightful to dwell upon and it is no small consolation to me to believe it in my power to spare you not only a considerable share of personal inconvenience but also to preserve you from evils your unsuspicious nature dreams not of what does that last part mean monsieur rodolphe asked rigolette much surprised proceed with the letter we shall see by and by rigolette thus resumed i know upon how little you can live and of what service even a small sum would be to you in any case of emergency i am very poor myself but still by dint of rigid economy i have managed to save fifteen hundred francs which are placed in the hands of a banker it is all i am worth in the world but by my will which you will find with this i have ventured to bequeath it to you and i trust you will not refuse to accept this last proof of the sincere affection of a friend and brother from whom death will have separated you when this meets your eye oh monsieur rodolphe cried rigolette bursting into tears this is too much kind good germain thus to consider my future welfare what an excellent heart he must have worthy and noble-minded young man rejoined rodolph with deep emotion but calm yourself my good girl thank god germain is still living and by anticipating the perusal of his last wishes you will at least have learned how sincerely he loved you nay still loves you and only to think said rigolette drying up her tears that i should never once have suspected it when first i knew m girandeau and m cabrion they were always talking to me of their violent love and flames and darts and such stuff but finding i took no notice of them they left off wearying me with such nonsense now on the contrary germain never named love to me when i proposed to him that we should be good friends he accepted the offer as frankly as it was made and ever after that we were always excellent companions and neighbours but now i don't mind telling you monsieur rodolphe that i was not sorry germain never talked to me in the same silly strain but still it astonished you did it not why monsieur rodolphe i ascribed it to his melancholy and i fancied his low spirits prevented his joking like the others and you felt angry with him did you not for always being so sad no said the grisette ingenuously no i excused him because it was the only fault he had but now that i have read his kind and feeling letter i cannot forgive myself for ever having blamed him even for that one thing in the first place said rodolph smiling 
you find that he had many and just causes for his sadness and secondly that in spite of his melancholy he did love you deeply and sincerely to be sure and it seems a thing to be proud of to be loved by so excellent a young man whose love you will no doubt return one of these days i don't know about that monsieur rodolph though it is very likely for poor germain is so much to be pitied i can imagine myself in his place suppose just when i fancied myself despised and forsaken by all the world some one whom i loved very dearly should evince for me more regard than i had ventured to hope for don't you think it would make me very happy then after a short silence rigolette continued with a sigh on the other hand we are both so poor that perhaps it would be very imprudent ah well monsieur rodolphe i must not think of such things perhaps too i deceive myself one thing however is quite sure and that is that so long as germain remains in prison i will do all in my power for him it will be time enough when he has regained his liberty for me to determine whether tis love or friendship i feel for him until then it would only torment me needlessly to try to make up my mind what i had better do but it is getting late monsieur rodolphe will you have the goodness to collect all those papers while i make up a parcel of linen ah i forgot the little bag containing the little orange-coloured cravat i gave him no doubt it is here in this drawer oh yes this is it oh see what a pretty bag how nicely embroidered poor germain i declare he has kept such a trifle as this little handkerchief with as much care as though it had been some holy relic i well remember the last time i had it around my throat and when i gave it to him poor fellow how very pleased he was at this moment some one knocked at the door who's there inquired rodolph want to speak to ma'am mathieu replied a harsh hoarse voice and in a tone which is peculiar to the lowest orders madame mathieu was the matcher of precious stones to whom we have before referred this voice whose accent was peculiar awoke some vague recollections in rodolph's breast and desirous of elucidating them he took the light and went himself to open the door he found himself confronted by a man who was one of the frequenters of the tapis franc of the ogress and recognized him instantly so deeply was the print of vice stamped upon him so completely marked on his beardless and youthful features it was barbillon barbillon the pretended hackney coachman who had driven the schoolmaster and the chouette to the hollow way of bouqueval barbillon the assassin of the husband of the unhappy milkwoman who had set the labourers of the farm at arnouville on against la goualeuse whether this wretch had forgotten rodolph's face which he had never seen but once at the tapis franc of the ogress or that the change of dress prevented him from recognising the chourineur's conqueror he did not evince the slightest surprise at his appearance what do you want inquired rodolph here's a letter from ma'am mathieu and i must give it to her myself was barbillon's reply she does not live here it's opposite said rodolph thank ye master they told me the left-hand door but i've mistook rodolph did not recollect the name of the diamond matcher which morel the lapidary had only mentioned once or twice and thus had no motive for interesting himself in the female to whom barbillon came with his message but yet although ignorant of the ruffian's crimes his face was so decidedly repulsive that he remained at the threshold of the door curious to see the person to whom barbillon brought the letter barbillon had scarcely knocked at the door opposite to germain's than it opened and the jewel matcher a stout woman of about fifty appeared with a candle in her hand ma'am mathieu inquired barbillon that's me my man here's a letter and i waits for an answer and barbillon made a step forward to enter the doorway but the woman made him a sign to remain where he was and unsealed the letter which she read by the light of the candle she held and then replied with an air of satisfaction say it's all right my man and i will bring what is required i will be there at the same hour as usual my respects to the lady yes missus please to remember the porter oh you must ask them as sent you they are richer than i am and she shut the door rodolph returned to germain's room when he saw barbillon run quickly down the staircase the ruffian found on the boulevard a man of low-lived brutal appearance waiting for him in front of a shop although the passers-by could hear it is true they could not comprehend barbillon appeared so delighted that he could not help saying to his companion 
come and lush a drain of red tape nicolas the old moth swallows the bait hook and all she'll show at the chouettes old mother martial will lend a hand to peel her off the swag and afterwards we can box the cold meat in your barky note two come and let's have some brandy together nicolas the old woman falls easily into the snare she will come to the chouettes mother martial will help us to take her jewels from her forcibly and then we can remove the dead body away in your boat End of note two. let's mizzle then note three for i must get back to asnières early or else my brother martial will smell summit note three let's be quick then and the two robbers after having exchanged these words in their own slang went towards the rue st denis some minutes afterwards rigolette and rodolph left germain's got into the hackney coach and reached the rue du temple the coach stopped at the moment when the door opened rodolph recognized by the light of the dram shop lamps his faithful murphy who was waiting for him at the door of the entrance the squire's presence always announced some serious and sudden event for it was he alone who knew at all times where to find the prince what's the matter inquired rodolphe quickly whilst rigolette was collecting several things out of the vehicle a terrible circumstance monseigneur speak in heaven's name monsieur the marquis d'harville you alarm me had several friends to breakfast with him this morning he was in high spirits had never been more joyous when a fatal imprudence pray come to the point pray and playing with a pistol which he did not believe to be loaded wounded himself seriously monseigneur well something dreadful what do you mean he is dead d'harville ah how horrible exclaimed rodolph in a tone so agonized that rigolette who was at the moment quitting the coach with a parcel said alas what ails you monsieur rodolph some very distressing information i have just told my friend mademoiselle said murphy to the young girl for the prince was so overcome that he could not reply is it then some dreadful misfortune said rigolette trembling all over very dreadful indeed replied the squire yes most awful said rodolph after a few moments silence then recollecting rigolette he said to her excuse me my dear neighbour if i do not go up to your room with you to-morrow i will send you my address and an order to go see germain in his prison i will soon see you again ah monsieur rodolphe i assure you that i share in the grief you now experience i thank you very much for having accompanied me but i shall soon see you again shan't i yes my child very soon good evening monsieur rodolphe added rigolette and then disappeared down the passage with the various things she had brought away from germain's room the prince and murphy got into the hackney coach which took them to the rue plumet rodolphe immediately wrote the following note to clemence madame i have this instant learned the sudden blow which has struck you and deprived me of one of my best friends i forbear any attempt to portray my horror and my regret yet i must mention to you certain circumstances unconnected with this cruel event i have just learned that your stepmother who has been no doubt in paris for several days returns this evening to normandy taking with her polidori no doubt but this fact will convince you of the peril which threatens your father and pray allow me to give you some advice which i think requisite after the appalling event of this morning every one must but too easily conceive your anxiety to quit paris for some time go therefore go at once to aubier so that you may arrive there before your stepmother or at least as soon as she make yourself easy madame for i shall watch at a distance as well as close the abominable projects of your stepmother adieu madame i write these few lines to you in great haste my heart is lacerated when i remember yesterday evening when i left him him more tranquil and more happy than he had been for a very long time believe madame in my deep and lasting devotion rodolph following the prince's advice three hours after she had received this letter madame d'harville accompanied by her daughter was on the road to normandy a post-chaise dispatched from rodolph's mansion followed in the same route unfortunately in the troubled state into which this complication of events and the hurry of her departure had driven her clemence had forgotten to inform the prince that she had met fleur de marie at st lazare our readers may perhaps remember that on the previous evening the chouette had been menacing madame seraphin and threatening to unfold the whole history of la goualeuse's existence 
affirming that she knew and she spoke truth where the young girl then was the reader may also recollect that after this conversation the notary jacques ferrand dreading the disclosure of his criminal course believed that he had a strong motive for effecting the disappearance of la goualeuse whose existence once known would compromise him fatally he had in consequence written to bradamanti one of his accomplices to come to him that they might together arrange a fresh plot of which fleur de marie was to be the victim bradamanti occupied by the no less pressing interests of madame d'harville's stepmother who had her own sinister motives for taking the charlatan with her to m d'orbigny finding it no doubt more profitable to serve his ancient female ally did not attend to the notary's appointment but set out for normandy without seeing madame seraphin the storm was gathering over the head of jacques ferrand during the day the chouette had returned to reiterate her threats and to prove that they were not vain she declared to the notary that the little girl formerly abandoned by madame seraphin was then a prisoner in saint lazare under the name of la goualeuse and that if he did not give ten thousand francs four hundred livres in three days this young girl would receive the papers which belonged to her and which would instruct her that she had been confided in her infancy to the care of jacques ferrand according to his custom the notary denied all boldly and drove the chouette away as an impudent liar although he was perfectly convinced and greatly alarmed at the dangerous drift of her threats thanks to his numerous connections the notary found means to ascertain that very day during the conversation of fleur de marie and madame d'harville that la goualeuse was actually a prisoner in saint lazare and so marked for her good conduct that they were expecting her discharge every moment thus informed jacques ferrand having determined on his deadly scheme felt that in order to carry it into execution bradamanti's help was more than ever indispensable and thereon came madame seraphin's vain attempts to see the doctor having at length heard in the evening of the departure of the charlatan the notary driven to act by the imminence of his fears and danger recalled to mind the martial family those fresh-water pirates established near the bridge of asnières with whom bradamanti had proposed to place louise in order to get rid of her undetected having absolutely need of an accomplice to carry out his deadly purposes against fleur de marie the notary took every precaution not to be compromised in case a fresh crime should be committed and the day after bradamanti's departure for normandy madame seraphin went with all speed to the martial end of chapter two read by celine major chapter three of the mysteries of paris volume four by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain l'île du ravageur the following scenes took place during the evening of the day in which madame seraphin in compliance with jacques ferrand the notary's orders went to the martial the fresh-water pirates established at the point of a small islet of the seine not far from the bridge of asnières the father martial had died like his own father on the scaffold leaving a widow four sons and two daughters the second of these sons was already condemned to the galleys for life and of the rest of this numerous family there remained in the ile du ravageur a name which was popularly given to this place why we will hereafter explain the mother martial three sons the eldest la louve's lover twenty-five years of age the next twenty and the youngest twelve two girls one eighteen years of age the second nine the examples of such families in whom there is perpetuated a sort of fearful inheritance of crime are but too frequent and this must be so let us repeat unceasingly society thinks of punishing but never of preventing crime a criminal is sentenced to the galleys for life another is executed these felons will leave young families does society take any care or heed of these orphans these orphans whom it has made so by visiting their father with a civil death or cutting off his head does it substitute any careful or preserving guardianship after the removal of him whom the law has declared to be unworthy infamous after the removal of him whom the law has put to death no the poison dies with the beast says society it is deceived the poison of corruption is so subtle so corrosive so contagious that it becomes almost invariably hereditary but if counteracted in time it would never be incurable strange contradiction 
dissection proves that a man dies of a malady that may be transmitted and then by precautionary measures his descendants are preserved from the affection of which he has been the victim let the same facts be produced in the moral order of things let it be demonstrated that a criminal almost always bequeaths to his son the germ of a precocious depravity will society do for the safety of this young soul what the doctor does for the body when it is a question of contending against hereditary vitiation no instead of curing this unhappy creature we leave him to be gangrened even to death and then in the same way as the people believe the son of the executioner to be an executioner perforce also they will believe the son of a criminal also a criminal and then we consider that the result of an inheritance inexorably fatal which is really a corruption caused by the egotistical neglect of society thus if in spite of the evil mark on his name the orphan whom the law has made so remains by chance industrious and honest a barbarous prejudice will still reflect on him his father's offences and thus subjected to undeserved reprobation he will scarcely find employment and instead of coming to his aid to save him from discouragement despair and above all the dangerous resentments of injustice which sometimes drive the most generous disposition to revolt to ill society will say let him go wrong if he will we shall watch him have we not jailers turnkeys and executioners thus for him and it is rare as it is meritorious preserves himself pure in spite of the worst examples is there any support any encouragement thus for him who plunged from his birth in a focus of domestic depravity is vitiated quite young what hope is there of cure yes yes i will cure him the orphan i have made replies society but in my own way by and by to extirpate the smallpox to cut out the imposthume it must come to a head a criminal desires to speak prisons and galleys they are my hospitals in incurable cases there is the executioner as to the cure of my orphan adds society i will reflect upon it let the germ of hereditary corruption ripen let it increase let it extend its ravages far and wide when our man shall be rotten to the heart when crime oozes out of him at every pore when a robbery or desperate murder shall have placed him at the same bar of infamy at which his father stood then we will cure this inheritor of crime as we cured his progenitor at the galleys or on the scaffold the son will find his father's seat still warm society thus reasons and it is astonished and indignant and frightened to see how robberies and murders are handed down so fatally from generation to generation the dark picture which is now to follow the fresh-water pirates is intended to display what the inheritance of evil in a family may be when society does not come legally or officially to preserve the unfortunate victims of the law from the terrible consequences of the sentence executed against the father note four in proportion as we advance in this work its moral aim is attacked with so much bitterness and as we think with so much injustice that we ask permission to dwell a little on the serious and honourable idea which hitherto has sustained and guided us many serious delicate and lofty minds being desirous of encouraging us in our endeavours and having forwarded to us the flattering testimonials of their approval it is due perhaps to these known and unknown friends to reply over again to the blind accusations which have reached we may say even to the bosom of the legislative assembly to proclaim the odious immorality of our work is to proclaim decidedly it appears to us the odiously immoral tendencies of the persons who honour us with the deepest sympathies it is in the name of these sympathies as well as in our own that we shall endeavour to prove by an example selected from amongst others that this work is not altogether destitute of generous and practical ideas we gave some time back the sketch of a model farm founded by rodolph in order to encourage teach and remunerate poor honest and industrious labourers we add to this honest men who are unfortunate deserve at least as much interest as criminals yet there are numerous associations intended for the patronage of young prisoners or those discharged but there is no society founded for the purpose of giving succour to poor young persons whose conduct has been invariably exemplary so that it is absolutely necessary to have committed an offence to become qualified for these institutions which are unquestionably 
most meritorious and salutary and we make a peasant of the bouqueval farm to say it is humane and charitable not to make the wicked desperate but it is also requisite that the good should not be without hope if a stout sturdy honest fellow desirous of doing well and of learning all he can were to present himself at the farm for young ex-thieves they would say to him my lad haven't you stolen some trifle or been somewhat dissolute no well then this is no place for you this discordance of things had struck minds much superior to our own and thanks to them what we considered as a utopianism was realized under the superintendence of one of the most distinguished and most honourable men of the age m le comte portalis and under the able direction of a real philanthropist with a generous heart and an enlightened and practical mind m allier a society has been established for the purpose of succouring poor and honest persons of the department of the seine and of employing them in agricultural colonies this single and sole result is sufficient to affirm the moral idea of our work we are very proud and very happy to have been met in the midst of our ideas our wishes and our hopes by the founders of this new work of charity for we are one of the most obscure but most convinced propagators of these two great truths that it is the duty of society to prevent evil and to encourage and recompense good as much as in it lies whilst we were speaking of this new work of charity whose just and moral idea ought to have a salutary and fruitful result let us hope that its founders will perchance think of supplying another vacancy by extending hereafter their tutelary patronage or at least their solicitude over young children whose fathers have been executed or condemned to an infamous sentence involving civil death and who we will repeat are made orphans by the act and operation of the law such of these unfortunate children as shall be already worthy of interest from their wholesome tendencies and their misery will still more deserve particular notice in consequence of their painful difficult and dangerous position let us add the family of a condemned criminal almost always victim of cruel repulses apply in vain for labour and are compelled in order to escape universal reprobation to fly from the spot where they have hitherto found work then exasperated and enraged by injustice already branded as criminals for faults of which they are innocent frequently at the end of all honourable resource these unfortunates would sink and die of famine if they remained honest if they have on the other hand already undergone an almost inevitable corruption ought we not to try and rescue them whilst there is yet time the presence of these orphans of the law in the midst of other children protected by the society of whom we have spoken would be moreover a useful example to all it would show that if the guilty is unfailingly punished his family lose nothing but rather gain in the esteem of the world if by dint of courage and virtues they achieve the re-establishing of a tarnished name shall we say that the legislature desires to render the chastisement still more terrible by virtually striking the criminal father in the fortune of his innocent son that would be barbarous immoral irrational is it not on the contrary of the highest moral consequence to prove to the people that there is no hereditary succession of evil that the original stain is not ineffaceable let us venture to hope that these reflections will appear deserving of some attention from the new society of patronage unquestionably it is painful to think that the state never takes the initiative in these questions so vital and so deeply interesting to social organization end of note four the ancestor of the martial family who had first established himself on this islet on payment of a moderate rent was a ravageur a river scavenger the ravageur as well as the débardeur and déchireur of boats remained nearly the whole of the day plunged in water up to the waist in the exercise of their trade the débardeur bring ashore the floating wood the déchireur break up the rafts which have brought the wood equally aquatic as these other two occupations the business of a ravageur is different going into the water as far as possible the ravageur or mud-lark draws up by aid of a long drag the river sand from beneath the mud then collecting it in large wooden bowls he washes it like a person washing for gold dust and extracts from it metallic particles of all kinds iron copper lead tin pewter brass the results of the relics of all sorts of utensils the ravageurs indeed often find in the sand fragments of gold and silver jewellery 
brought into the seine either by the sewers which are washed by the stream or by the masses of snow or ice collected in the streets in which are cast into the river we do not know by what tradition or custom these persons usually honest and industrious are called by a name so formidable martial the father the first inhabitant of this islet being a ravageur and a sad exception to his comrades the inhabitants of the river's banks called it the île du ravageur the dwelling of these fresh-water pirates was placed at the southern end of the island in daytime there was visible on a sign-board over the door au rendez-vous des ravageurs good wine good eels and fried fish boats let by the day or hour we thus see that the head of this depraved family added to his visible or hidden pursuits those of a public-house keeper fisherman and letter of boats the felon's widow continued to keep the house and reprobates vagrants escaped convicts wandering wild beast showmen and scamps of every description came there to pass sundays and other days not marked with a red letter in the calendar in parties of pleasure martial la louve's lover the eldest son of the family the least guilty of all the family was a river poacher and now and then as a real champion and for money paid took the part of the weak against the strong one of his brothers nicolas the intended accomplice of barbillon in the murder of the jewel matcher was in appearance a ravageur but really a fresh-water pirate in the seine and its banks francois the youngest son of the executed felon rowed visitors who wished to go on the river in a boat we have alluded to ambroise martial condemned to the galleys for burglary at night with attempt to murder the eldest daughter nicknamed calabash calabas helped her mother in the kitchen and waited on the company her sister amandine nine years of age was also employed in the house according to her years and strength at the period in question it was dull night out of doors heavy grey opaque clouds driven by the wind showed here and there in the midst of their openings a few patches of dark blue spotted with stars the outline of the islet bordered by high and ragged poplars was strongly and darkly defined in the clear haze of the sky and in the white transparency of the river the house with its irregular gables was completely buried in the shade two windows in the ground floor only were lighted and these windows showed a deep red light which was reflected like long trails of fire in the little ripples which washed the landing-place close to the house the chains of the boats which were moored there made a continual clashing that mingled unpleasantly with the gusts of the wind in the branches of the poplars and the hoarse murmurs of the main stream a portion of the family was assembled in the kitchen of the house this was a large low-roofed apartment facing the door were two windows under which a long stove extended to the left hand there was a high chimney on the right a staircase leading to the upper story at the side of this staircase was the entrance to a large room containing several tables for the use of the guests at the cabaret the light of a lamp joined to the flame of the fire was strongly reflected by a number of saucepans and other copper utensils suspended against the wall or ranged on shelves with a quantity of earthenware and a large table stood in the middle of the kitchen the felon's widow with three of her children was seated in the corner near the fireplace this woman tall and meagre seemed about five-and-forty years of age she was dressed in black with a mourning handkerchief tied about her head concealing her hair and surrounding her flat livid and wrinkled brows her nose was long and straight her cheekbones prominent her cheeks furrowed her complexion bilious and sallow the corners of her mouth always curved downwards rendered still harsher the expression of her countenance as chilling sinister and immovable as a marble mask her grey eyebrows surmounted her dull blue eyes the felon's widow was employed with needlework as well as her two daughters the eldest girl was tall and forbidding like her mother with her features calm harsh and repulsive her thin nose her ill-formed mouth and her pale look her yellow complexion which resembled a ripe quince had procured for her the name of calabash calabas she was not in mourning but wore a brown gown whilst a cap of black tulle did not conceal two bands of scanty hair of dull and dingy light brown francois the youngest of the martial sons was sitting on a low stool repairing an aldrel a thin meshed net forbidden to be used on the seine in spite of the tan of his features this boy seemed in perfect health a forest of red hair covered his head his face was round his lips thick 
his forehead projecting his eyes quick and piercing he was not like his mother or his elder sister but had a subdued and sly look as from time to time through the thick mass of hair that fell over his eyes he drew a stealthy and fearful glance at his mother or exchanged a look of intelligence and affection with his little sister amandine the latter was seated beside her brother and was occupied not in marking but in unmarking some linen stolen on the previous evening she was nine years old and was as like her brother as her sister was like her mother her features without being more regular were less coarse than those of francois although covered with freckles her complexion was remarkably clear her lips thick and red her hair also red but silky and her eyes though small were of a clear bright blue when amandine's look met that of her brother she turned a glance towards the door and then francois replied by sigh after which calling his sister's attention by a slight gesture he counted with the end of his needle ten loops of the net this was meant to imply in the symbolical language of children that their brother martial would not return until ten o'clock that evening seeing these two women so silent and ill-looking and the two poor little mute frightened uneasy children we might suppose they were two executioners and two victims calabash perceiving that amandine had ceased from her occupation for a moment said in a harsh tone come haven't you done taking the mark out of that shirt the little girl bowed her head without making any reply and by the aid of her fingers and scissors hastily finished taking out the red cotton threads which marked the letters in the linen after a few minutes amandine addressing the widow timidly showed her the shirt and said mother i have done it without making any reply the widow threw her another piece of linen the child did not catch it quickly enough and it fell on the ground her tall sister gave her with a hand as hard as wood a sharp slap on the arm saying you stupid brat amandine resumed her seat and set to work actively after having exchanged with her brother a glance of her eye into which a tear had started the same silence continued to reign in the kitchen without the wind still moaned and dashed about the sign in front of the house this dismal creaking and the dull boiling of a pot placed over the fire were the only sounds that were heard the two children observed with secret fright that their mother did not speak although she was habitually taciturn this complete silence and a certain drawing in of the lips announced to them that the widow was in what they called her white passion that is to say was a prey to concentrated irritation the fire was going out for want of fuel francois log said calabash the young mender of forbidden nets looked into a nook beside the chimney and replied there are no more there then go to the woodpile said calabash francois murmured some unintelligible words but did not stir do you hear me francois inquired calabash harshly the felon's widow laid on her knees a towel she was also unmarking and looked at her son he had lowered his head but he guessed he felt if we may use the expression the fierce look his mother cast upon him and fearful of encountering her dreaded countenance the boy remained without stirring i say are you deaf francois said calabash in an irritated tone mother you see the tall sister seemed to be happy in finding fault with the two children and to seek for them the punishment which the widow pitilessly inflicted amandine without being observed gently touched her brother's elbow to make him quietly do what calabash desired francois did not stir the elder sister still looked at her mother as demanding the punishment of the offender and the widow understood her with her long lean finger she pointed to a stick of stout and pliant willow placed in a recess near the chimney calabash stooped forward took up this staff of chastisement and handed it to her mother francois had seen his mother's gesture and rising suddenly sprung out of the reach of the threatening stick do you want mother to break your back exclaimed calabash the widow still holding the willow stick in her hand pinched her pale lips together more and more looked at francois with a fixed eye but without uttering a syllable by the slight tremor of amandine's hands with her head bent downwards and the redness which suddenly overspread her neck it was easy to see that the child although habituated to such scenes was alarmed at the fate that threatened her brother who had taken refuge in a corner of the kitchen and seemed frightened and irritated mind yourself mother's going to begin and then it will be too late said the tall sister i don't care replied francois turning pale 
i'd rather be beaten as i was the day before yesterday than go to the woodpile and at night again and why asked calabash impatiently i am afraid of the woodpile i answered the boy shuddering as he spoke afraid you stupid and of what François shook his head but did not reply will you answer what are you afraid of i don't know but i am frightened why you've been there a hundred times and last night too i won't go there any more mother's going to begin so much the worse for me exclaimed the lad but she may beat me kill me and i'll not go near the woodpile not at night once more why not inquired calabash why because 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 there's some one there's some one buried there said francois with a shudder the felon's widow in spite of her impassiveness could not repress a sudden start her daughter did the same it seemed as though the two women were struck with an electric shock some one buried by the woodpile said calabash shrugging her shoulders i tell you that just now whilst i was piling up some wood i saw in a dark corner near the woodpile a dead man's bone it was sticking a little way out of the ground where it was damp just by the corner added francois do you hear him mother why the boy's a fool said calabash making a signal to the widow they are mutton bones i put there for washing lye it was not a mutton bone replied the boy with alarm it was a dead person's bones a dead man's bones i saw quite plainly a foot that stuck out of the ground and of course you told your brother your dear friend martial of your grand discovery didn't you asked calabash with brutal irony francois made no reply nasty little spy said calabash savagely because he is as cowardly as a cur and would as soon see us scragged as our father was scragged before us if you call me a spy i'll tell my brother martial everything said francois much enraged i haven't told him yet but i haven't seen him since but when he comes here this evening i'll the child could not finish his mother came up to him calm and inexorable as ever although she habitually stooped a little her figure was still tall for a woman holding the willow wand in one hand with the other the widow took her son by the arm and in spite of alarm resistance prayers and tears of the child she dragged him after her and made him ascend the staircase at the further end of the kitchen after a moment's interval there was heard heavy trampling mingled with cries and sobs some minutes afterwards this noise ceased a door shut violently the felon's widow descended then as impassive as ever she put the stick in its usual place seated herself close to the fireplace and resumed her occupation without saying a word End of chapter three read by celine majeure